a major renovation of the Roaring Brook Nature Center, which is part of the Children's Museum Group, has begun a groundbreaking ceremony for the $700,000 project. The center will remain open to the public during the renovation. The project will include new and improved outdoor enclosures for injured, orphaned, and resident wildlife, a state-of-the-art wildlife rehabilitation clinic, new front entryway, and an additional classroom exhibition area. These additions will allow the center to increase the number of wild animals admitted to rehabilitation, provide opportunities for visitors to see wildlife rehabilitation in progress through a one-way window into the clinic, while also providing better viewing of our permanent birds of prey. The additional classroom and exhibit area will increase the number of educational offerings that the center can offer and provide visitors an even more enjoyable experience. George Trumbull, a major donor to the project, stated, I couldn't be more pleased to be part of this journey. This wonderful institution will get even better. In spite of the rain and the overcast skies, the sun is shining bright on Roaring Brook Nature Center today. A huge thank you goes out to the Roaring Brook Nature Center's many supporters, including the John T. and Jane A. Wielderhold Foundation, who provided a grant of $225,000 as well as significant contributions from the Trumbull Family Foundation, the Connecticut Freemasons Foundation, and Roaring Brook Nature Center's auxiliary organization, the Friends of Roaring Brook. In 2014, we hosted our second gala event, which raised $10,000 to start this process, said Susan Duncan, auxiliary treasurer. We look forward to seeing the fruits of our labors. The event included several speakers, including Jean Madden Hennessy, campaign co-chair and donor George Trumbull, Trumbull Family Foundation, campaign co-chair Susan Duncan, auxiliary treasurer and donor, Peter Stevens, president of the Children's Museum Board of Trustees, Leslie Hill, Canton First Select Person, and Jay Kaplan, director of Roy Brook Nature Center. Canton's first select person, Leslie Hill, addressed the crowd. She stated, the nature center is near and dear to my heart. As a resident and parent, this is a jewel and a tremendous partner in the town of Canton. It is heartwarming and a wonderful resource. The Roaring Brook Nature Center provides nature and science-based learning experiences to approximately 20,000 people. It provides the community with opportunities to connect with the natural world at any age and gain an appreciation and understanding for wildlife. In addition, the center takes in several hundred injured and orphaned wild animals each year for rehabilitation with the goal of releasing them back into the wild.
She's mighty, mighty. Just let me out. Hey, now, now she's a brand new house. Well, she's the one, the only one built like a lamb. So why'd you folks come to the parade today? Um, this is these are Acorn Exchange students from Switzerland, Austria, and Italy, and I told them they have to come to the parkour parade because it's such a part of West Hartford. When you think of your visit to America, I don't know. It's different, very different from Italy. And where are you from? I'm from Italy. From Italy. Oh. oh. <laughs> Which part of Italy? I'm from Rome. Rome. Okay. <laughs> So what what have you what have you discovered so far about America? Um, there are a lot of Dunkin' Donuts here, <laughs> <laughs> especially in New England. Yeah. Yes. So I'm Don Ennis, and I'd like to know, why'd you come to the parade today? Well, my son's in the parade. He's in the parade? What's he doing? He's playing the trumpet. I'm wondering, why are you guys here at the parade today? Why'd you come? Because it was A and B together. We love parades. We love parades, yay! We come to the parkour parade every year. This is every year? This is my first one. Oh, really? So, never been to the parkour parade. Oh, 
why did you come to the parade? Well, I, two reasons. I, I'm, I'm part of the Park Road neighborhood. I live right down the street on uh, Richard Street. And, uh, you know, whenever they have a community event, you know, I just love being part of it. And we want to just spread the word that, you know, we're, we have a, a church at Smith School. And, uh, you know, just try to spread a lot of good wealth and just a lot of joy. That's right. Yes. Right to everyone, right? Yes, everybody. Yes. And, and I see you have little doggies to hand yes, out. Yes, little things to hand out, little candies <laughs> and little cross candies. That's great. Right. That's wonderful. Yeah. Well, God bless and thank you very well, thank much. Thank you. God bless you too. Thank you, Pastor. Yeah. day mean to you? Um, it's really an exciting day for me. Um, How are you? I feel like it's a great honor for um, the business association here in Elmwood to plant this tree in my name and I feel like it tells I guess it tells something about me I've, um, and what I've given back to the community, but I also think it tells a lot about our community and how much we um, value our sense of community and our history and education. So it's really exciting. Who gets to have this? Who gets to have a tree planted for them? And, you know, hopefully. Um, it will be an elm that um, raises this piece of land for, for a long time. We're celebrating our love of the earth and our shared heritage with its flora. We are celebrating the ability to express our freedom. We're celebrating the freedom from clipboards. Um, <laughs> we're celebrating life and appreciating the moment. We're celebrating teachers who sow the seeds of learning. That's an applause line. community. This piece of land that we are standing on has been a central focus of our community for almost 250 years. It was originally the space between two neighbors' homes, Ebenezer Faxon and James Talcott. The name of this space is officially William E. Blanchfield Park, named for the late Bill Blanchfield, who was a great advocate for Elmwood and West Hartford. Before that, it had been known as Burgoyne Rest, Burgoyne Elms, and Victory over Burgoyne Park. Many of you remember for over 40 years this land was covered by asphalt and in 2005 the pavement was removed and the green space was restored. The surrounding community of Elmwood has always seen itself as a distinct entity. This was the industrial section of town, home to Goodwin Pottery and the Beach Farm. This was the Catholic parish in a town run by Congregationalists. These divisions have faded over the years but Elmwood remains Elmwood. So. As the 240th anniversary approached, I wanted to plant a tree and involve the community because the Elmwood Elms have always represented something greater. And my first thought was to honor the Noah Webster House in West Hartford Historical Society. They're all about bringing history to life and telling the stories that make West Hartford the diverse community that it is today. And then uh, we had just recently partnered with Knox Inc. over the last uh, year or two. and. They're just a wonderful group. Using horticulture, they have built community, provided jobs, education, and jobs training. And they have been a great friend to Elmwood. Uh, Knox Inc. has provided our, our elm tree today, and uh, the planters that you've seen here and in other parts of town. Um, and third, Dr. Tracy Wilson. Tracy's career in education began in that building over there. Tracy has excelled at bringing history, a special, especially local history, alive. Over the years, I've had many of Tracy's students as patients. When I asked them who they had for history, they'd roll their eyes and they'd say, uh, Dr. Wilson. <laughs> at the end of the semester, I'd ask them how it went, and universally they'd respond, I worked harder than I ever have before, and I learned so much. And having spoken at two previous elm plantings, a tr a Tracy was the logical person to have to speak again. But of course, there's a little more to this story. A uh, diagnosis of cancer forever changes your life. It forces you to accept your mortality and prepare for what is to come. And yet, a diagnosis of cancer doesn't necessarily mean you are dying. So what better way is there to reaffirm life than to plant a tree? 
and Tracy, thank you for letting us honor you with this trip. Tracy is such a remarkable woman. Um, this is a remarkable couple. Um, I also have met so many students of Tracy's that have talked about how she has transformed their life, and it is such a profound, they will have a, such a profound look in their face and their eyes, uh, and so many of them have gone on to do amazing things, but that spark, that individual comment or something that she did to tap into that fever, that passion, that interest, that um, something that rocked their world, and she changed them forever, and it is unbelievable to have that kind of legacy to touch so many people so strongly and so profoundly and i i wish i could have a list of all the students that over time that i have talked to that have uh, have been inspired by her and that make our world a better place she has paid it forward in such a big way it's it's it makes our world a better place um susan b anthony said Cautious, careful people always casting about to preserve their reputations can never affect reform. And Tracy is one of those people where if somebody had a criticism or a disagreement with the way she handled something, it didn't matter. If she knew that it was right and if she knew that she was going to make a change in her world or in somebody else's world, she would go ahead and do it. And I want to thank you for that. The other thing actually... This one I thought was actually really good. Um, make the most of yourself by fanning the tiny inner sparks of possibility into the flames of achievement. That was said by Golda Meir, and that's what Tracy did every day walking into her classroom. And I just also, again, want to thank her for flaming so many students throughout our world, throughout our town, throughout our state, and throughout our world for, and for all that um, remarkable work that she did. So 240 years ago, this place wasn't known as Elmwood yet. In fact, it wasn't even called West Hartford. Instead, it was known as the West Division of the city of Hartford. It was the farming district, home to about 100 families. One of those families was the Websters, who had a homestead on South Main Street that we all recognize today. In the fall of 1777, that's right, 240 years ago, news had reached even the sleepy West Division that British General John Burgoyne was wreaking havoc in upstate New York and Vermont. And like many New Englanders, the people of the West Division were enraged. A band of militiamen got together, including Noah Webster, his father, and his two brothers, and they headed towards the action in Saratoga. It took the West Division militia about two days to make the 60-mile trip to the east bank of the Hudson. And when they got there to the muster point, they found that they were too late for battle. On October 13th, the American forces had defeated General Burgoyne at the Battle of Saratoga, which ended up being a turning point in the Revolutionary War. And I think Dr. Wilson is going to tell us a little bit more about what that meant um, as a victory for the country and why these elm trees and liberty trees were planted at that time. The event also was a turning point in Webster's life. While he was encamped along the Hudson, he was struck by the variety of languages, dialects, and accents that he heard. And it was at that moment that the idea to create an American English emerged. He realized that for our fledgling nation to survive, a common language and culture would be needed. And it was this impetus that led him to write the Blueback Speller and the American Dictionary of the English Language, which changed the American lexicon in remarkable ways that we still are feeling the effects of today. It was this place, the West Division, West Hartford, that made it possible for Noah Webster to achieve those masterpieces. He had grown up in this once small farming community, and he had learned important things like keeping a rigorous routine, developing a strong work ethic, Yankee ingenuity, and stick-to-itiveness. All of these qualities helped Noah Webster succeed on a 26-year Herculean effort to write the first American Dictionary. Today, as the Noah Webster House and West Hartford Historical Society, we strive to help residents learn to understand and appreciate the past. In these days of consciously thinking about who should be commemorated and what statues can stand, I feel even more honored that there was consensus that I'm one for the ages. <laughs>
These elm trees represent these historical questions, and they represent the kind of community in which we live. Faxon planted elm trees, and we plant elm trees as a symbol of liberty, and also a way to gather our community to remind us that we are not just 63,000 individuals living out our daily lives in isolation, but that our lives are made better by living in community and by celebrating and enjoying the community in which we live. In a lot of ways, a community like Elmwood, like West Hartford, is a covenant. It's an agreement to live together. And in a covenantal relationship, we ask not what we get, but what we give. This job of teaching students how to live an examined life is passed from one generation to the next. Like the idea of liberty embodied in these elm trees, our teaching reverberates beyond our classroom. So thanks once again for this great honor. I'm so happy to have moved to this community 40 years ago, and today to feel rooted in this place. You have allowed me to branch out, to plant seeds, and to provide shade for students and people who needed it. And in this past year and a half, as I have had to learn to live with cancer, I have been so grateful to my family, friends, and this community for your support. Without you, I don't think I'd be here today, basking in this day on this busy corner, just aching to get to the apples and donut holes. <laughs> Thank you.